Alright, what's up everybody? Today we got a really good application-based question, so I'm excited to get to it. Um, it says, Stomach ulcers and gastritis are known to be caused by a bacterium called Helicobacter pylori. Um, Helicobacter pylori. This bacterium causes disease by infecting the stomach's lining. Which of the following tissue types is H. pylori infecting? And the four answer choices we have are epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous. So this video is going to be a great way to overview the four main tissues in our body because we do have four and they are mentioned here, right? These are the four. Uh, and also see how they apply to this particular problem. This also hits close to home because believe it or not, my roommate in college had gastritis. I don't think he had a helicobacter pylori uh, infection, but he had gastritis, which I just think is... Uh, perfect application, right? These things that we talk about apply to a lot of a lot of things outside of just MCAT questions. Um, with that being said, the nerd in me also wants you to know that I know that this is supposed to be italicized, this Helicobacter pylori, um, but I can't italicize in this app. Uh, but just know, also for your per, uh, future per, uh, future papers that you write, like anytime you write the name of a species, it's supposed to be italicized. So with that said, let's move on. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about H. pylori. So H. pylori is a gram-negative bacterium. So gram-negative means that it has a small um, peptidoglycan wall, right? Peptidoglycan wall. I'm going to just abbreviate it peptido wall. Uh, because outside of that wall, what it also has is a lipo lipopolysaccharide membrane, um, LPS membrane, okay? Um, Gram-negative bacterium are just a type of bacterium. They're cra they're classified by the gram test, and if they if they stain a certain color on the gram test, they're negative. If they stain a different color, then they're positive. Um, stomach. So H. pylori is actually linked to stomach ulcers and gastritis. So it's known to cause that now. But before two thousand and five, but before um, like nineteen eighty, I think we didn't actually know that. We just assumed stomach ulcers and gastritis were not caused by a certain. Um, disease and causing pathogen. We just thought they were conditioned. But that's the reason why in 2005, a Nobel Prize was awarded to see two scientists named Dr. Marshall and Dr. Warren because they discovered that H. pylori was the thing that was causing stomach ulcers and gastritis. It's an actual bacterium that's causing these diseases, which is insane because before that, no one thought that was the case. But these two individuals figured it out and that's why we now have a Nobel Prize for them. The other thing about these two individuals is that Dr. Marshall, how he proved, how did he prove that H. pylori, how did he prove that H. pylori leads to infection or, or gastritis? How did he prove it? Believe it or not, he experimented on himself. He took, um, I think, a Petri dish of just Helicobacter pylori and he drank it. Uh, and within two or three days, he started developing stomach ulcers. And so just know that if you ever want to ex experiment on humans, the only human you have a full right to experiment on is yourself. And as you can see here, Dr. Marshall did it and he got a Nobel Prize for his work. So it's not an encouragement, but it's pretty impressive. So as you can see by this image on the upper left-hand corner, um, H. pylori infects the lining of the stomach. And I want to know what tissue is the lining. And the reason why I want to know what tissue the lining is, is because there are four main tissues in our body. We have connective tissue, right? We have uh, nervous tissue. Oh, darn it. Connective is such a hard word to spell. Ah, anyway, connective, nervous. Uh, and then we have muscular tissue. And last but not least, we have this phenomenal thing called epithelial tissue. So I want to know, is the lining of the stomach epithelial tissue? Is it muscular tissue? Is it uh, neuronal or is it connective? Let's find out. Let's go through these one by one. So let me, this here, right here is nervous tissue. Nervous tissue is what comprises the nervous system. The nervous system is made up of two things, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system includes the brain and the dandy brain, which is also the only organ that studies itself. How cool is that? Anyway, uh, the next one is this spinal cord. All right. So the brain and the spinal cord comprise of the uh, central nervous system. Everything else, all else, you know, like believe it or not, in your hand, there are nerves. There are nerves in your leg. There are nerves in your eyes. All those nerves that are not the brain or the spinal cord, that's part of the peripheral nervous system. Okay. And so both of these nervous systems include cells. Okay. So nervous tissue is going to be a group of cells that come together to form um, nervous, the nervous system. Okay. And so these two main types of cells include the first one right here, 
um, on the left side of the diagram is the neuron. So that is the lovely neuron. As, as many people know, that's the uh, general thing that runs the nervous system. But there's also this second cell, which I've drawn on the right, or, or depicted on the right, and that's called the glia. All right? There are type, different types of glia. You'll notice that there's a glia that's called an oligodendrocyte, which actually helps myelinate cells. There's something called a microglia, which is another type of cell, and an astrocyte, which is yet another type of glia. Both of these cells come together to form the nervous tissue. And I haven't said this already, but a tissue is a group of cells that work together to form a particular function. So nervous tissue is going to make the nervous system of the brain. So the thing that differentiates the neurons from the glia is that the neurons are actually going to have these things called action potentials, which I'm sure a lot of you know about. It's a basically an electrical impulse that's about one millisecond, and that basically allows us to think, to move, to do everything in our life. Glia, on the other hand, have no action potentials, and that's because glia are pretty much the supporters of the of the neurons. Okay, the glia are the uh, supporters of the neurons. Okay, they're the support system for neurons, so they give the neurons all they need, um, and they kind of are just there, but they don't actually have the impulse system going. All right. With that being said, let's move on to the next tissue. Um, and again, I'm giving you an insight into all of these tissues because I want to help answer the overall question, which is, what tissue is the lining of the stomach? Um, okay, so our second tissue is going to be muscular tissue. Muscular tissue, as many of you already know, includes the muscles in your body. And of these muscles, there's a ton of muscles in your body, but there are actually three different types of uh, muscular tissue. Okay, the first one right here is called skeletal muscle. So this is the flexing muscle. So I'm sure all of you have had those. This is my hand, right? This is your bicep. <laughs> it's a really bad drawing, but the point is your bicep is kind of the flexing muscles that we're used to seeing. Skeletal muscle is basically a striated, striated muscle. So you'll see here in the drawing that there are striations in this muscle. It looks like there are separations and segmentations. Uh, more importantly, it's usually attached to the skeleton and it's voluntary. So anytime you're moving and you're flexing and you're flexing muscles and you can tell you're flexing them, it's uh, usually skeletal muscle that you're flexing. Okay. The second muscle, this is the easiest to remember. It's called cardiac muscle. And the reason why it's the easiest to remember is because cardiac muscle is only found in the heart, only the heart. Okay. Uh, more important than that, cardiac muscle is involuntary, right? When you want to flex your bicep, you actually have to think, okay, I'm going to flex my bicep now. But have you ever had to think, okay, my heart will contract now? No, you don't because your heart contracts with, um, with cardiac muscle and cardiac muscle is involuntary. But the thing that cardiac muscle does share with um, skeletal muscle is that it is also striated. So you'll notice the striations between cardiac and smooth muscle is a similarity. And last but not least, we have smooth muscle, which is number three in the leftmost on your screen. It's called smooth because there's no striations, right? We've had striations in cardiac muscle. We've had striations in uh, skeletal muscle, but no striations in smooth muscle. And it basically is responsible for uh, peristalsis. Remember peristalsis? It's actually when you swallow, your um, esophagus starts contracting and takes the food all the way down to your stomach. Peristalsis is involuntary. Believe it or not, if you if you just chew, you never have to actually think about digesting your food because your entire digestive system is made up of these smooth muscles. And the smooth muscles prevent um, these smooth muscles are involuntary, and so you never have to think about actually contracting them. So that's what I mean. They're involuntary. And the reason why I have ANS here is because they're controlled they're controlled by the thing called the autonomic nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system is again something that's responsible for the subconscious aspect of your body, right? Your breathing rate, your your um, digestive rate, all that stuff. So those are the three types of muscles, and that's muscle tissue. And I gave you examples of all of them. Now let's move on to epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue. So this is tissue that lines the outside and inside of all organs. The thing that most students associate with epithel epithelial tissue is skin. Right, the outside of your body is skin, and that's the thing that lines the outside of your of your body, and that's an epithelial tissue. But more important than that, the inner lining of the digestive tract is also an epithelial tissue, right? Like if you think about the stomach, in this case, the lining of the stomach, and I'm going to give you the answer here, so listen closely. The lining of the stomach is actually epithelial tissue because the inside and outside of every organ, right? Let's say like the pancreas, even. This is, oh no, this is the liver. Let's say this is the liver, right? 
even the liver, the outside of the liver is going to be made out of epithelial tissue, right? And that's because the epithelial tissue, the function, as is written at the bottom, the function is to protect, okay? And that's why the outside of every organ, and even the inside, right, like the lining of the stomach, which is literally the outside of the stomach, is going to be epithelial tissue because it's intended to protect us from any sort of bacteria that may, might be coming, any sort of harm that we run into in our environment. And now I also want to go over these two small things, simple versus stratified. Simple epithelial tissue just has one layer of cells, right? One layer. So simple is one layer. So if you have simple epithelium, you just have one layer of that epithelium. But if you have stratified epithelium, right? Stratified epithelium is more than one layer. And it's, that's exactly why it's called stratified, because there's striations. Because you have so many layers that you have striation. Okay, so that's more than one layer. And so with that being said, let's move on to our last tissue, which I personally think is the hardest to understand. The hardest is the connective tissue. Because connective tissue basically just connects the three tissues together. Remember the three tissues we already talked about? Muscle, epithelium, and nervous tissue. Those three tissues are connected by connective tissue, right? You can think about blood. Blood is a connective tissue, as is written on here. Bone is a connective tissue. Cartilage is a connective tissue, and fat is a connective tissue. Connective tissue connects your body together. Remember blood? Blood runs through your entire body. It connects your head to your toes. Bone connects your head to your toes. Cartilage is a way that connect, like it's found in your nose, right? So cartilage connects your nose to your face. Like These connective tissues are, are responsible for keeping us together. But they're also the hardest to understand because they're kind of like the all else category, right? Like nervous tissue at least has neurons, muscular tissue has muscle, epithelial cells, epithelial tissue at least has the outside and inside of organs. But connective tissue is everything else, all right? And the other way to distinctively know connective tissue is that it consists of cells that secrete their own extracellular matrix, right? So this is a cell, right? And what it will do is that it will secrete out a bunch of stuff. And it, as it's, whatever it secretes is called the extracellular matrix, which is abbreviated ECM, okay? And this extracellular matrix can be a lot of things. It could be fat, right? It could be bone. Um, uh, it could be, well, let me erase this first and rewrite it. It could be bone, or it could even be cartilage, right? All of these cells are going to release the extracellular matrix, which then goes to make the connective tissues we've talked about. So remember, fat on this end, so now let's apply this. Fat is the extracellular matrix of this thing called adipocytes. So adipocytes are cells that as they grow, they secrete fat into their extracellular matrix. So all this fat that we're eating is secreted by adipocytes and it's a type of connective tissue. Cartilage, which is found in our nose, is an extracellular matrix of chondrocytes. Chondrocytes are the cells that secrete cartilage, okay? And chondrocytes are an example of connective tissue. And bone is the extracellular matrix of osteocytes. And so osteocytes are another cell type that secrete a connective tissue. So now let's go back to our question. We've gotten an intense look at all four types of tissues, but which one applies to us? And I already gave the answer when I was talking. The, the one that applies, so this is the stomach right here, right? And we have a perfect drawing of it. The lining of the stomach is what this question was asking us. And the lining, as, I've, and as I'm drawing right now, the lining is literally going to be epithelial tissue because the epithelial tissue is found on the inside and outside of all organs. So the inside of the stomach, we want to make sure that things that go into the stomach are not being disturbed. So this is actually going to be, the lining of the stomach is going to be epithelial tissue, okay? But remember, our stomach is not just epithelial tissue. We have a bunch of tissues coming together. So tissues come together to form organs, right? And our stomach is an organ. And so the stomach actually will have all four tissue types. All right. And I'm going to show you right now where they are. Okay. So the stomach is an organ, but let me change color so I can be cool. Notice that the top is an epithelial tissue layer, right? Because it's protecting it. But let's move down. We move down and we see nervous tissue. Why do we have nervous tissue in the stomach? Because this sends signals to our brain like, oh, prereq is hungry now. Prereq is full now. Prereq is, pre pre is done now. Right? So that actually helps um, us know what we're digesting, even though we're not actively thinking about it. Right above nervous tissue, there's smooth muscle. 
Remember muscle tissue? The smooth muscle helps our stomach contract. You never have to think about digesting. So our stomach has smooth muscle in it, not a skeletal muscle. And last but not least, at the bottom, you'll see there's connective tissue. And there's connective tissue because it's holding the stomach together. There's blood going to the stomach, the blood coming out of the stomach. The, the connective tissue is giving the stomach all of its lining. Uh, not all of its lining, all of its um, durability. And with that being said, we go back to our question. And we know that H. pylori infects the lining of the stomach, right? Stomach's lining. And so what tissue type is it? It's epithelial, all right? So H. pylori affects epithelial tissue, although all of these other tissue types are still found in the stomach. So the answer here is A. And with that, we're done with yet another question. Hope you enjoyed it. Share it this video. Uh, let me know if you have questions. And I look forward to seeing you guys in the next one. Thanks for watching.